Maya, when Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, appreciate the opportunity to raise this issue before the Rules Committee, and I think it's probably none of it a surprise to anybody on this committee on, on where we are with this. And um, I will just tell you that I'm asking for a waiver. I concede that if I bring language to the floor under an open rule and appropriations that has uh, the word notwithstanding in it, it's, uh, you know, it's an alarm bell that will cause a, um, some, a point of order to be raised. And I will concede that that point of order is very difficult to argue that it's in order under the rule. Um, we are at this point with this CR. This is the maximum amount of leverage that we will see in this 112th Congress. And the amendment that I'm seeking a waiver for is the amendment that shuts off the funding for the automatically appropriated Obamacare legislation. Most in this Congress were not aware that that was written into the bill. Um, we dug into it as recently as last week and working with the CRS, they did publish a report on Friday that totals $105.5 billion in automatic appropriations that are written into the Obamacare bill. And uh, that is, um, those appropriations span out over 10 years. Some of it is, is loaded in different ways, but one just might think in terms of $10 billion a year. And because this House has voted to repeal Obamacare, and the, we've already voted as a majority of this House to remove all sections of the bill, my, of Obamacare and the Associated Reconciliation Package, my amendment just goes in and uses the model that I pulled out from my memory of the Vietnam War era, actually, where uh, there's language there that was in a CR. They did it in several ways, but one was, um, the primary one was a CR in, um, in 1974 that stated, um, notwithstanding any other provision of law, no funds appropriated or heretofore appropriated shall be used to, for defensive or offensive operations in Vietnam or the adjoining countries. Um, I went back and took that model and wrote that into my amendment as a, essentially as a standard. And uh, the rationale is this, that first, the automatic funding. Um, we, we saw the legislative maneuvering that passed Obamacare, and that, that was part of what came up. First we pass the bill, then we find out what's in it. Um, most of us on our side of the aisle campaigned to repeal and defund and deauthorize Obamacare. We've taken the first step to repeal. The next step is to defund. And the effect of my amendment would freeze in place the implementation of Obamacare. We recognize that two federal courts have ruled it unconstitutionally in all or in part. And uh, therefore, for us to continue to fund an unconstitutional piece of legislation is a burden on us, having taken our oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I understand that there's a rules conundrum here. And, and uh, gentlemen and gentle lady, I, uh, I'm more sensitive to the burden that's of the Rules Committee, gentle ladies, I'm more sentence, uh, sensitive to the burden of the Rules Committee than um, probably any time in my now starting the ninth year here. Um, however, I would make the case that we do take the oath to uphold the Constitution, not the rule. And I followed the process that one would ask a responsible member to do in that I requested that my language be written into the bill. Uh, it was not. This is the next stop along the way, and it's the last stop before the floor. Um, there's been much discussion about letting the House work its will and uh, about regular order. Well, I would submit that regular order on an appropriations bill would be perhaps hearings before subcommittees, markups before subcommittees, markups before the full committee. At two of those three stops, there would have been an opportunity for a member to offer my amendment in which case it would have been in order, and had it passed, it would have been written into the base bill with or without the cooperation of the people that make those decisions on what's written into the bill. So I've done my due diligence. That's my argument. I've done my due diligence. I believe that my amendment passes the floor of this House if it's allowed to be debated, and I have a degree of confidence in that. Um, it is um, the... The dedication to the rules is something that you in this committee have to be more sensitive to than any other members of this Congress. And, and yet, the dedication to the Constitution is what all of our oath is to. And so I'm, um, I'm of this position that 
I want the House to work its will. We didn't have regular order, or my language would have been voted on by now someplace along the way. This is the last stop before the floor. I want, I want a regular order, but I want the House to work its will. And I'm asking this committee to grant a waiver for my amendment so that there can be a debate on the floor and a vote on the floor. If we do this, we're consistent with our oath of office. We're also consistent with fiscal responsibility. It's not in a one-year cut that would be $105.5 billion, but over 10 years it would be $105.5 billion. It's the only tool that I know that freezes in place the implementation of Obamacare. And if we let it grow, then it grows its roots down in and it gets harder and harder and harder to eradicate. So I, I wish there was an easy way to take this cup from all of you. And if there is a way, I'm open to hearing from that. Um, at this point, I have carried this ball for a year and a half. It's been the primary issue that I fought against before it was passed and now fought to repeal it after it was passed. And I'm not in a moral position to make concessions that might diminish the responsibility to finally repeal Obamacare. But I am in a position, I think, to turn my ear to the people involved here in this committee and to leadership if there happens to be a solution that is better than the one that I'm offering. And I would... Uh, Yield back my thank time you, uh, to the chairman. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Mr. King. We uh, let me let me first uh, express appreciation to you for your extraordinary dedication to a cause that I know that every member on this side of the aisle shares. Every single member here has cast a vote to um, repeal uh, this outrageous health care bill, which I believe undermines the potential for job creation and economic growth and dramatically expands the size and scope and reach of government and um, legislation that did unfortunately pass was signed last March is uh, something that I believe is potentially very very dangerous and I share that and I appreciate your recognition of the challenge that this uh, committee faces uh, on this issue it is true uh, we're, we're trying to have the the most free-flowing open debate possible uh, under uh, a structure that has under a continuing resolution which it's not been done before and uh, the one thing that I can assure you is that we are going to pursue every possible means that we can to uh, make sure that we don't fund this program throughout the process throughout the last 18 months when you've been working so diligently on this I said all along that I thought that the natural step for us would be to take the mandate, which hires up to 18,000 new IRS agents to enforce the mandate. And I will tell you that I've read, uh, I was just talking to, to Daniel Webster, who happens to be a, a good friend of uh, Roger Vinson's, the, uh, the judge who, who um, offered the, uh, the brilliant 78-page decision. I've read every word of it. In fact, he, um, he quotes some of my favorite framers, Federalist 34, which was authored by Alexander Hamilton and the two authored by James Madison 45 and 51 in which he he points to the the constitutional questions of this and so I will tell you that my lawyer and I actually went through it together every page every one of the 78 pages of the Vincent decision um, so I will I will say that uh, I share the goal of getting exactly where you are and I know I, I can't speak for my colleagues on, on the other side of the aisle here, but I know that I speak for all of my colleagues here when I tell you that we do. Um, and I, and I want to get there. We know that uh, we are now five or six weeks into this Congress, and I believe uh, that personally that we need to, to proceed with uh, as open amendment process as possible. And, uh, and I... And I respect your desire and willingness to continue to work with us so that we can get to exactly where we want to be as we proceed. So, Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. King, welcome to the Rules Committee again. Uh, I, as, as, uh, as the facts of the case, you have been a regular visitor over the nine years to the Rules Committee, bringing thoughtful ideas not only to the committee, but uh, in, with a thoughtful articulation about what is behind your ideas. Uh, as you know, this committee has the awesome responsibility to look after and try and shepherd through, including proposals that are crafted by the Rules Committee from hearing from all sorts of members with their great ideas. And this is one of the things which 
Chairman Dreyer and I think to, to some extent myself, really welcome the opportunity for us to hear from members and especially on the floor through this free flowing process. With that said, sometimes we hear discussions that we may not have heard as thoughtfully as what you presented and, and I heard you talk about this 10 year, $105 billion uh, health care bill proposal, the funding uh, piece for what might be known as Obamacare. We're actually working under a one year right now CR. Do you know how much money you would be seeking for us because we certainly wouldn't include the language probably for the 10 year necessarily but in this one year piece. Is that right? We would be looking at funding, uh, stopping the funding for this cycle right now, what might be 2011? Mr. Sessions, my, my language goes to all that's automatically enacted for Obamacare. So it is $105.5 billion, okay. and it, it freezes it all. Um, if we looked at it on an annual basis, yes. I did not break that apart for the 10 years. We've been a little uh, under some pressure here. But I know that there's, um, I, well, I'll say, I, I believe that I read that there is a one, fi there, there's one single $5 billion component, and then if you average the balance, so it's probably slightly more than $10 billion for this fiscal year. So about a $10 billion. I mean, we, we could argue if we just that divided, did our mathematics and divided it up. The um, reason why I say this is you're not at odds at all with this committee. This committee, as the chairman has indicated, has... Uh, well, you'd be our favorite son. We would welcome what you're bringing to us. We're also attempting, I think, to make sure that what we do to get it done and the $100 billion that we, I think, have had a very active conversation across this country. I think many Americans recognize, and I saw on national TV, this is a big week in Washington, D.C., for the $100 billion, and I just want you to know I am very focused on the amendments that you're bringing, the ideas that you bring. I'm also very focused on getting, getting the $100 billion done as best as we can, knowing that we have tried to sell this across the country. We would want to put pressure on the Senate and the President with actual spending this year. And so I find your amendment intriguing, and I appreciate you doing this, and I, as always, my friend, Look forward to uh, work continually working with you, and I appreciate your thoughtful ideas as you came just today. I yield back my time. I respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, one thing that I overlooked. I, I have in my hand an email from uh, a previous speaker who lived through one of these periods of time in 1995 that uh, makes a recommendation, uh, and I'd ask consent to deliver that to the committee members for their review. Thank you. Thank and it's from Newt Gingrich for the record. In summary, it simply asks the same thing that I'm asking here, as um, since he has um, perhaps as much experience with this type of an issue of anybody on the planet, that's how I raise the issue with him, as a matter of fact. And uh, this is what he volunteered to respond back to and ask me to deliver this to the Rules Committee. So I'm appreciative of Speaker Gingrich for stepping up in support of this, um, along with a good number of other national groups that have been engaged. And, um, and, you know, I, I continue to make my point that I believe this is good for the country or I wouldn't be sitting here. And I yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Slaughter. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to uh, respond to Mr. Sessions um, a couple things. I know two uh, judges have found it unconstitutional, but two have found it perfectly constitutional. Ten states threw it out. So that's not quite decided yet. But I, Mr. Sessions had asked how much you would save with your amendment. I don't know that, but I do know that the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office said that 30 in, in 10 years this bill will cut the deficit by over 30 billion. And I certainly want to get that on the record. And if I might, to clarify into the record too, my astute chief of staff handed me the memo for the balance of this fiscal year, FY11. My amendment would would uh, reduce our spending by 4.9 billion for the balance of the fiscal year. The rest of that would be going forward in the nine years from that point onward. Well, I guess the question is, would you rather save 30 billion, get that off the deficit, or, or, or destroy this and, and uh, uh, take health care away from an awful lot of people? That's 
really, I think, probably. The I don't know that that race had anything to do with my calculation. You know, nobody's ever mentioned this. I just want to ask this as a hypothetical question because I'm asking a lot at home. Uh, $250 has already been paid to senior citizens who were in the donut hole. Are you expecting them to pay that back? No. Uh, everything that I've offered with the repeal or this amendment simply stops and freezes it in place. It doesn't go back and undo anything. And that, it doesn't undo anything. It doesn't undo anything. It just, it just stops it as if you shut the valve off. Um, both money coming and money going. That's, that's been the analysis, and we've gone back for some more professional opinions than mine, and they've concurred in that. Do you, you do not agree with the CBO? There are times I don't agree with the CBO, but I don't always know the, um, the assumptions that they use to come to those conclusions. And I saw a pretty fast moving uh, tall tallies on this bill as it was moving towards passage. So by the time it passed, I didn't have confidence that the CBO numbers were accurate. I would like to see the difference between overall spending versus overall revenue. And I know that there are tax increases in Obamacare, and I know there's significant spending. Uh, the chairman of the Budget Committee has said that Obamacare itself uh, spends about $2.6 trillion. A lot of saving, too. So that's a, that's a lot of money. You know, I, I always have said this so many times before, you must be getting tired of hearing it, but we didn't do that health care bill because we were masochists or because I wanted somebody to throw a brick through my window or my life threatened. We did it because 17% of the GDP was spent on health care, rising all the time. It's such a clip that there was no way in the world that we could keep up with it. And we could eventually, the way we were going, simply be paying Medicare and Social Security and very little else. And so we did it, really, uh, to try to get under control the health care spending in the United States. And I, uh, I'd like to see it work and see how that does. So it's the same debate that you're making now was made about both Social Security and Medicare, that they would be the ruination of the world. I made a lot of um, debates on that uh, myself. And, of course, we have two different viewpoints on how to approach this. And um, we've, we've heard the voice of the House at this point and 47 Republicans in the Senate. And uh, it's a strong position. Uh, and the public seems to be getting stronger in opposition to Obamacare over the weeks and months. And the more we are in session dealing with it, the more they seem to be lining up in the position that I'm in. And uh, so I think we owe them an opportunity to have a vote so that they can verify where we are on shutting off the funding. I, I've made the argument for 10 months on the tactic to eliminate Obamacare is first pass the repeal and then begin to shut off the funding in every appropriations bill. And I've got writings on that that go back to the middle of last summer at least. Well, this is the first one. This is the biggest one. This is the most leverage, and it's one that cries out the most to be addressed by this Congress to be consistent with what we've done with H.R. 2. It's ironic to me that this is H.R. 1. And, uh, you know, I asked that the repeal of Obamacare be H.R. 1, and I wasn't disappointed when H.R. 2 was the repeal. But it's ironic that our opportunity to shut off all funding to Obamacare would be on H.R. 1. And if we miss that opportunity, somehow the perfect... Um, symmetry of H.R. 1 and 2 just won't be fulfilled. and Kind of like a love lost, I would say. Something missed that can never be recaptured again. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Ms. Slater. Ms. Fox. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. King, for coming. Um, I want to echo the comments that have been made by uh, the Chairman and Mr. Sessions in terms of our feeling like we're with you on this, obviously, since every single one of us voted to repeal Obamacare. But you've, you've just pointed out something that I <clears throat> think needs to be mentioned. Um, we voted to repeal Ob Well, I think probably the reason this is H.R. 1, uh, because we knew we were going to be facing the continuing resolution. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to continue the funding for the federal government. And... Uh, Obamacare was number two. I think that was appropriate that we voted on it immediately. I don't have any problem with that at all. But we know what happened to the bill when it went over to the Senate. At first, uh, Mr. Reed said there would be no vote on it. You know, it was sort of over my dead body. And then there was this dust up over in Egypt. And all of a sudden, Mr. Reed had a good cover when people were paying attention to other things, and he suddenly brought it up for a vote, and of course, the vote failed. Um, 
Now, we have been accused over and over again of wanting to shut down the federal government, and we've said over and over again that's not our intentions. We want to go forward with the continuing resolution. Um, we're sorry that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle could not get their appropriations passed last year. But what do you think would happen if your amendment is put on the continuing resolution when it gets to the Senate? Well, it um, fits into the same category as uh, what might happen with the $100 billion in cuts. It, it comes down to where are the votes and where is the leverage. And uh, I have made the point that there's not a dime that can be spent by the federal government unless the House at least concurs. And uh, so that's, that's something that can't be seen at this point. Uh, if we had not sent the repeal of Obamacare over to the Senate, uh, we would be accused of not taking up an issue that we believed in. And if we don't cut off the funding to the implementation of Obamacare, the same accusations that, that we expected then would come on this. But um, we are cutting off the funding to the implementation of Obamacare in this bill. We're cutting off the funding as, we, as it is available to us to cut off in the continuing resolution. So all of the funding that we can identify uh, that fits within this category is being cut off in the continuing resolution. And do you know what that total is? Uh, no, I haven't added it up, but it's, uh, I don't know, 300, 500, uh, well, almost 2 billion. Yeah. And, but while that's going on, there's 4.9 billion in this fiscal year that's, that's automatically appropriate. And then, uh, the balance of roughly another 100 billion dollars that gets automatically appropriated to implement Obamacare that, that unless we find a vehicle to shut it off, Obamacare will be implemented, and it could happen on our watch while we're cutting a couple of billion. But we have lots of vehicles to shut it off that are coming up. We have the budget process coming up, and we have the appropriations process coming up. And so we have, uh, your, your uh, assertion is that this is the only chance that we have. The best and I don't chance. believe that is not the case, because... We're going to have lots of opportunities to cut off the funding for Obamacare. Again, I expect us to pass appropriations bills, and I believe through the appropriations process we can cut the funding off in future years. That's, uh, that is an option available to us. Well, I would submit that the, uh, the budget process won't be a vehicle, but the amendments, the, the appropriations will be, but each one of them is significantly less than the leverage. And so if our leverage diminishes, then our opportunity to succeed in negotiations with the Senate and the President also diminishes proportionally. That's why I think this is the vehicle. But if we send it over on the continuing resolution and the Senate rejects it, then there is no leverage. So your argument is that there's leverage because it's on the continuing resolution. It do, the Senate can do, doesn't have to accept the continuing resolution, as you just said. I would submit if the House is not willing to insist, the President will get what he wants eventually. Well, the House has insisted, and we're going to continue to insist that this not be funded. Every single one of us has taken as strong a position as you have taken. I have, I have railed against Obamacare as much as anybody in this body. Uh, I have spoken against it over and over and over again. I write letters against it over and over and over again, editorials against it. I mean, I, I have no positive thing to say about it. But as you know, you are asking us to um, change the rules here in the Rules Committee. And what that does then is open us up to the same accusations that were made uh, of our colleagues across the aisle over the last four years in terms of their not being fair to us. And I, I think that is putting us in a very tough position. Mrs. Fox, I never thought I would be sitting here hearing that asking for a modified open rule in order to shut off the uh, funding to Obamacare was uh, the implication that uh, you know, I should have somehow given a deference and not made the ask. This is too important not to ask. It's too important not to come before this committee and make this case. I would have liked to have had it written into the bill. I would have liked to have had the amendment go before the Appropriations Subcommittee or full committee. I'd like to have had a regular that says we can't 
We can't have the vote and we can't have the debate unless there is a waiver provided by this committee. It's the only place I have to make this argument. And, and as I see it, there may be a disagreement tactically. You may believe and, and that the smaller appropriation bills offer a better opportunity to shut off this $105 billion. I believe that the more money that's at stake, the more leverage you need to, be, to succeed. But and Mr. So that's where I disagree. But Mr. Is. King, don't you are, you have another opportunity to do this? You can offer the amendment on the floor. Any member can offer any amendment on the floor, and you know that. And so we're not shutting you out from offering your amendment on the floor. I, I announced uh, as I sat down here that there will be a point of order raised, and uh, the point of order is likely to be sustained. And I have reservations about challenging the ruling of the chair if I think they have a parliamentary point. It's hard for me to make that argument when I've come before this committee to say, my amendment will not be in order. I understand it will be, not be in order. I knew that from the middle part of last summer. I, I marched down through all of the things that you can ask a member to do. If my franchise is as precious as anyone in this Congress is, and we have the same passion to oppose this issue. But I have tried every other alternative, and if this alternative does not succeed, the next thing that I'm facing is offer the amendment on the floor, listen to somebody raise a point of order, and I can reserve my right to object and make my argument, but to actually challenge the ruling of the chair when I've told this committee I don't believe my amendment is in order, that's why I came here to ask for the waiver, it'd be inconsistent. I think it'd be, um, it'd be morally and fundamentally inconsistent for me to do that. But it is consistent constitutionally for this Rules Committee to evaluate an unconstitutional bill and realize that it's very unlikely that even under the astute leadership of the, of the chairman that we'll go through the 112th Congress without a modified open rule. I expect that will happen. And when that happens, I hope that if I'm not successful here tonight, we're not looking back thinking, well, if we were going to write a modified open rule, why didn't we do it to unfund Obamacare? Well, I... Um I really would like to see you offer your amendment on the floor. I know that you can offer your amendment on the floor to defund Obamacare, and um, I, I think that that would be the fairest way to do it. Um, again, I join with my colleagues. I'm sure every single one of us is going to say basically the same thing to you. We agree with you that this program should be defunded. It is, in my opinion, opinion, an abomination to this country that this bill was passed. And I find it really curious that my colleagues on the other side have talked about how this process is going so fast. They, are net, they want to slow down everything that cuts funding, but they're always in a hurry when it comes to spending. The stimulus bill was pushed through. Obamacare was pushed through. Anytime they want to spend money, they're in a big hurry to do it. When we want to slow down the spending of money or cut funding, all of a sudden we should, we're in too big of a hurry to do it and we should be slowing down. Um, but I, I appreciate your efforts. I've appreciated your efforts for the last year and a half. As I said, uh, you've been joined many, many times by all of us here, except the new people who are here, uh, saying basically the same thing. And um, I appreciate your efforts. Thank, Thank you. Ms. Fox. I, I just want to say I been one of the most fascinating uh, discussions that I've witnessed in the Rules Committee for a long time. I think you're being told in a very uh, polite way, no. Um, but uh, you know, as you know, the Rules Committee can do whatever it wants to do. It can grant the waivers, and you know, if they want to make it an order, they can. But I just want to point out for the record, even though I strongly disagree with what you're trying to do, uh, there are eight of them and only four of us. So I can't help you, even if I wanted to. <laughs> Thank you. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. McGovern, and I appreciate uh, joining together for the State of the Union address. That was good for our. That was that was that was uh, that was a great time. We we were seatmates. Yeah. Jim was my date that night. I'd be looking forward to having that dialogue as soon as it could be constructively enabled. Thank you.
Hey, I just want to tell you how happy I was you were here, Mr. King. The, as you know, I think you're a real champion on issues, uh, champion on issues uh, uh, like this. I appreciate uh, what you've done uh, on the fair tax uh, uh, time and time again, and I, I put this in this category of things that uh, somebody's got to stand up and and uh, and say it. And it, uh, there's no doubt that uh, you have uh, uh, your colleagues' attention, uh, this committee's uh, attention, the media's attention, and uh, with uh, with those kinds of of uh, of talents combined with the, the bright minds that Mr. Bishop just talked about, I just have no doubt that uh, that success is around the corner. Success that, that we're all seeking. So I just I thank you for having the, the uh, courage to push this all the way to the end. Thank you, Mr. Whittle. Uh, Mr. Polis, no doubt. Mr. King, great seeing you tonight. You know, you have really stood out amongst a lot of folks in regards to your push and your desire in regards to defunding Obamacare. I know that I don't think you have to convince, at least from Mr. Dreyer over this way, uh, about doing just that. I think that's a mission of ours uh, and to get this country straight again in regards, particularly as it relates to Obamacare. So, you know, we, we want to get together. We need to work together. And we need to come up, and I think, you know, we heard Mr. Bishop say about the brightest minds. I'm not the brightest mind, but I certainly am one that loves to hear a good idea. And you have a good idea. And we need to be able to work uh, cooperatively to get to the end game. The end game is to defund Obamacare. Uh, and that's, I think, where we all want to go. So with that said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nugent. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, this has been an interesting conversation, one that I keep hearing in my mind. Please, please, please don't do this. But at the end of the day, here's what I'm thinking. We will find a way to accomplish the goal. I know I have a, a bill that has been, you know, hopefully will be co-sponsored by many members of the freshman class and other members of the Republican Conference do exactly what you're attempting to do, which is to defund Obamacare, period. Uh, the process by which we get there is important. That we get there is more important. If I might respond, Ms. Scott, I appreciate your interest in this, and I'm aware that you've taken an initiative to put language in, in authorization to defund Obamacare, and, and, I, and I do appreciate that initiative. I certainly am supportive of that. Um, my point on that is that in this environment with um, the other party and the majority in the Senate and the president of the, and the, his signature bill at stake, um, we need to have a way to have some leverage to make and to accomplish this. So each one of the pieces that we do contribute to the cause, you are, we are. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your courage. It takes courage to stand alone. You're standing alone. I really appreciate you doing it. you got a great idea. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Webster. I uh, looks like we have wrapped this down to perhaps a moment for me to conclude my statement. And uh, I could uh, maybe reach back to some cassette in my mind and turn this thing up to the maximum amount of marketing. But I think instead uh, I would say this, that I have had the ear of this committee on both sides. And it has been a good and healthy discussion. I believe, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe I'm right. And I believe this is the best opportunity with the maximum amount of leverage and the best, best timing that we could have. I think that of those who don't believe that, um, they should come up with a proposal that has a better prospect of success. And I'd be happy to have the, that kind of dialogue and it would be maybe more constructive before this committee would make a final decision. However, uh, whatever it is, um, my level of intensity is going to go in, in a direction that's designed to bring about the end of Obamacare. That you can count on, Mr. Chairman, how this committee decides. And I'm hopeful that the wise minds on this committee can come up with a better solution. And I can hope I can know about that uh, or else participate in that discussion. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. King. And I can assure you that as we proceed with the discussions on the issue of funding uh, or defunding Obamacare, there's no doubt about the fact that you're going to be right in the middle of those discussions because you have over the last 18 months, as you said correctly, been uh, such a, a stalwart and a champion on this. And we appreciate your being here and appreciate your 
dedication to uh, the Constitution and to the institution, and uh, we will um, obviously be taking your ideas and thoughts in consideration as we proceed. So thank you Thank you, very you Mr. Much. Chairman. I appreciate it. I thank the committee.